right now to everyone in the audience, just a quick introduction for you, Jeff. We do have with us Jeffrey Hirsch, the editor, editor in chief of the Stock Traders Almanac and the Almanac Investor. He's also the author of the little book of the stock market cycles, along with Super Boom, why the Dow will hit 38,820 and how you can profit from it. He's a 30 year Wall Street veteran, he took over from founder Yale Hirsch in 2001. And Jeff regularly appears on networks such as CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, and many other financial media outlets. All right, Jeff. Sorry, I had to give you that proper introduction. That's there. okay. That's okay. You guys can hear me. I just had to grab a, my coffee so I could have a little sip in case I get dry. So th thank you, everybody. I hope Mark is okay. I was looking forward to uh, hearing what he had to say. I had a question lined up for him about crypto. Um, and... I was uh, available on backup for money shows since they're getting um, threatened by Ian, the hurricane. I know some of you guys are there, so everyone stay safe. And um, I'm going to run through some slides I presented to my subs my subscribers. And, um, you know, Q3 outlook, profits, politics, prices, power of Putin. Interesting that we had a, an alliteration of P's for all the things that we're concerned about right now. So, um I'll just jump in and, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to take some questions. I might be able to field them myself from the, the chat since I'm logged in there too. But um, I'm getting together with some subscribers down at the Money Show. I don't need to stick um, with this slide too much, but uh, this is what I'm doing down in Orlando. Uh, hopefully the weather will be better. And um, I'm going to meet some of my um, my members for, for a drink and uh, some snacks. If any of you are, give me a holler and, and you can join me. Um, so our concern here is that uh, you know earnings growth is down. Um, this was, of course, something we presented um, last week to subscribers, uh, looking at you know what we're thinking about for this quarter. We've been defensive and in cash. Our, our portfolios have been stopped out throughout the year, uh, starting in January. If you go back and look at some of the stuff I, I did here in this space and 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 um, in my other presentations and and writings to, to subscribers and out there, we, we've been cautioning about volatility and the midterm bottom and all that stuff uh, all year long. So um, we're concerned with that uh, growth rate. This is the S&P and the forward um, earnings per share. You can see it's flattening going down. Uh, we're concerned about guidance going forward. We've been seeing that happening since we put this out. Um, so just uh, a look at from um, Sam Stovall's group, uh, you know, uh, CFRA, you can see the earnings estimates are dropping. Yes, there's some that are high energy has been jacked up with with the, you know, the war and, and other inflated prices there. But you can see that we're seeing some uh, overall decrease in earnings um, estimates. Looks a little bit better out, you know, next year. And the market tends to... Uh, you know, be a barometer, be a, a forward-looking mechanism, and uh, we'll start to rise when the outlook for earnings, you know, six, 12 months out um, begins to improve. But right now, we are, you know, struggling with those June loads. We're taking them out. GDP, we're seeing uh, a serious decline here in the outlook from um, the consensus estimates, as well as the Atlanta uh, Fed GDP now, which is one of the things that everyone's looking at these days. And, um, you know, there's talk about recession and the new rules that they have, but we had two quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. That's still a recession in my book. I know everyone, they changed the definition at the NBER uh, when COVID hit because they needed to redefine it somehow. But um, we're still thinking we're heading recession. That's become more and more apparent after the, um, the Fed's meeting. And uh, again, this was this was done before the Fed meeting. But whoops, sorry. Um, a little jumpy. So just back here. So consensus drifting lower, and um, it's looking like we're setting up for uh, a recession. It remains to be seen how deep it is. But again, the market and anticipating mechanism uh, will bottom well before the recession is over. And usually about the time that it gets declared, the market tends to bottom. So here we are uh, entering this um sweet spot of the four-year cycle as we go through this weak spot. This is uh, our chart uh, showing the, the aggregate um, four-year cycle going from the post-election year 
uh, you know, the first year of a new president, midterm year, which we're in now, pre-election year, the best year of the four-year cycle, and the election year. I've got Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ here, um, black, green, and gray, and then a thinner black line, which is the S&P 2021 to 2022. And you can see uh, this has been updated um, a little bit since this, and we, we've come through, we've taken out that, that June low. Um, so we are, you know, down here now. And the good news is it sets up for the best part of the whole four-year cycle. It's sort of the confluence of seasonality and the four-year cycle and um, uh, the rally that we see from the midterm low to the pre-election year high um, has been about 48% on average for the Dow, 68% for the NASDAQ. That's going back to 71 for NASDAQ and uh, 49 for S&P. But the sweet spot, Q4 of the midterm year and Q2, Q, Q1, Q2 of the pre-election year, about 20% for Dow and S&P and about 30% for NASDAQ. So while things are um, looking dire right now, um, it's probably a, a getting close to, to setting up for, for a nice buy signal. Hey, Jeff, I'm sorry yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you, but it looks like Mark has finally oh, arrived. All right, let me... um. Is Mark going to show some slides? Let me stop my share. Anyone who wants to find out more about this, tune in next week or uh, in October. I'll go through this again. Yes. Okay. Hello, Mark. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Good. Fine. I just arrived from Spain. I'm back in Dubai. Oh, my uh, goodness. Nice, nice warm Dubai. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. It's great to have you here with us. Well, it's a pleasure being with you. All right, then, Mark, will you be doing any screen sharing with us? Do you have a slide deck for today? I do, but I am completely at odds on how to share it with you. That's the big problem. Do you have a copy there? Um, I don't believe we do, but let's, let's see if I can, can I help share? guide you through that. Oh, wait a minute. Here, I can put share. Um, yes, there should share. be that green share screen arrow in the middle there at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the Zoom window. If you click on that, uh, it should give you some options. The Zoom, let's see if I got, if I go into uh, Zoom. Um, now I'm clicking on that, oh, not the green one. It's uh, the one I have is the blue, the blue Zoom thing, you know? Right, so when you click on the blue Zoom icon and then you enter the yeah. Zoom window, do you see there's a square with an arrow pointing up? It says share screen. You should see like mute, start video, security, share screen, apps, and more. Let me see if I got this. I think I'm gonna have to go back into Zoom, um, back into my, uh, to my, um, wait a minute. Let's go back to Outlook and then go. Oh, here we go. Mark, I think yeah. Virginia sent me along his uh, your PowerPoint presentation. Let's oh, see if this is right. All right. I'll see if I can go ahead and share it for you. Okay. Give me just one yeah. moment. I have it in front of me, actually. So I don't, I don't need, if you have it, then I can just tell you what I'm looking at and you can change the slides accordingly. Does this look right? It starts with inflation, interest rates, deflation, war in the market. Can you see this now? I see it in front of me, yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. But when I change it, when I change, does it change on your side? Uh, no, you'll have to tell me next slide okay. or something. Yeah. Okay. All right, then, Mark, let's get you introduced, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Mobius. He's the co-founder of Mobius Capital Partners. Mark has an excellent reputation as one of the most successful and influential managers over the last 40 years, and he's seen by many as the founder of the Emerging Markets Asset Class. Everyone, please type your questions for Mark into the live chat box. We'll do our best to get them answered for you, and we will see if we can extend this time a little longer so that he can get through his full presentation.
All right, Mark, I'll hand the mic on over to you now. Thank you, it's a pleasure being with you. Um, I wanna to talk today about inflation, interest rates, deflation, war, and the market. Uh, I've done a few studies on these factors and I'd like to share them with you. Uh, the next slide, of course, tells about how inflation leads to political instability. And you can see from the next slide, uh, what happened in Sri Lanka. I happened to be at this point in Sri Lanka when they were having demonstrations. And you can see the inflation protests that took place in front of the government buildings in downtown Colombo. Uh, I was there, it was rather peaceful, but still people were definitely very, very angry. Uh, and of course you can see on the next slide, the signs they were holding up on the inflation protest, enough is enough, uh, excellently go home Gota. Of course, Gota refers to the president at that time uh, and some other <laughs> slide, some other signs were not very kind. The next slide shows you uh, the origin of all this and that is the incredible increase in money supply in Sri Lanka, 70% increase uh, since 2016. Of course, uh, more recently, there've been more rapid increases and of course, when you have a money supply increase like that, the next slide shows you the result. You get an incredible inflation. In this case, it was somewhat delayed, but uh, between 21 and 22, 22, uh, you can see 750 increase in inflation numbers in Sri Lanka. And of course, that's the reason why everybody was so angry. And of course, the next slide shows you the rupee against the US dollar. And of course, you saw a 40% decline against the US dollar and uh, nice for tourists going to Sri Lanka, but very not very nice for people in uh, Sri Lanka. The next slide talks about the consumer price index, which is not an accurate measure of inflation. And as I say in my book, uh, The Inflation Myth, I point out that the CPI uh, as measured not only by the US, but by other countries around the world, is simply not a good measure. And the reasons as shown in the next slide are that goods and services do not always represent true uh, consumer expenditure, the things that they measure with the CPI. The base year changes from time to time. Commodity weights are not accurate. You know, sometimes people buy more of one thing or less of another thing, it's not, if you're taking an average, it's not very good. The basket of goods changes. And finally, there's no account for increased quality of goods and services. Uh, this is very important because uh, we're in a situation where you get a deflationary impact as a result of technology. The next slide is gonna talk about money supply as the cause of inflation. And you can see US money supply between 2016 and 2022 had a 75% increase. Uh, you must remember that when you have so much more money in the market, it's gonna lead to devaluation of the currency. And the other factor shown on the less, next slide uh, is that the, C, the money supply measure, M2 or whatever measure the government puts out does not take into account the crypto global market cap, which has boomed. It now represents about 2.6 trillion. And that's about, oh, something like 2% uh, of the US money supply, the official money supply in two. But uh, the velocity of this crypto market is so tremendous that it has a big impact on what people can spend. And you've had over 1,800% increase in the, the size of that market. And you can see the trading volume has increased by something like 1,800% since 2020. So this crypto market is an important factor when we look at money supply. And if you look at money supply in the US, in the next slide, versus the CPI, you can see that the CPI is not measuring the incredible increase in money supply. Uh, and this is something that is 
I think overlooked by many people. The next slide shows in the US, uh, the CPI inflation between 2016 and 2022. Of course, there has been a big increase uh, as a result of this increase in money supply, uh, but I don't think we're finished yet because at the end of the day, uh, with the incredible amount of money still in existence, we may even see higher inflation numbers, but in any case, uh, 8.6 is very high. The next slide shows you uh, the point that is very important to remember is that throughout history, all currencies lose their value. Over 550 currencies have gone extinct in the past 320 years. And if you can see the next slide, how uh, in Germany in 1923, children standing next to 100,000 German marks that were equal to only one US dollar. Uh, that is real currency devaluation. And we've been investing in Brazil for many years. And I remember when the uh, Brazilian Cruzeiro uh, was inflated like crazy. And of course they had to create uh, 10,000 uh, Cruzeiro notes and more. And of course, if you remember the Civil War, the Confederate States issued their own currency. And of course, as a result, that currency was uh, eliminated. Next question, does inflation influence the stock market? Which is uh, the next slide. And of course, if you look at the S&P index versus the CPI, you'll see that there's not very much a correlation, of course, the CPI, as I pointed out, is not an accurate measure of inflation. You really should look at money supply. And if you put this against money supply, it would look uh, more reasonable. But in any case, if you're looking at CPI and expecting a decline in the S&P index or any other index, you may be disappointed uh, because uh, the, in fact, the market has outperformed dramatically against the uh, CPI. Next question, next slide, do interest rates influence the stock market? And of course, if you look at the prime rate since 2000 and the S&P index, again, very low correlation. Uh, from time to time, you've seen the prime rate like in 2008 go down and the market went down when according to the theory of some people, it should have gone up. So the correlation is very, very low between these two indicators. Next slide, should central banks try to raise rates to kill inflation? And of course, you can see US inflation in the next slide versus the federal funds rate. Um, the federal funds rate, of course, has gone down with the inflation rate in 2020, but then you had an incredible increase in money supply, uh, but the CPI, did not change very much, but the stock market, um, and if you look at the, the funds rate, you'll see a big, big difference between the CPI and the Fed funds rate. So very little uh, correlation there, in fact, but now, of course, the central bank wants to raise rates in order to kill uh, the inflation, and uh, it'll take a lot more than we have now. Next question, is war bad for the stock market? If we look at the World War I, you'll see that the Dow Jones, at least at the beginning of the war, did fairly well. And then towards the end of the war came down and then straightened out. Uh, World War II, actually the market did quite well. Dow Jones index after 1942 uh, kept on going up. Vietnam War, more or less a sideways movement with lots of volatility, but certainly not a bear market uh, as a result of the war. So you can see that uh, if we're worried about Ukraine, it's probably not gonna have much impact on the stock market. If you can see the COVID-19 and Russia-Ukraine war numbers, you'll see that during COVID-19, the next slide, 2020, uh, the market after a big downturn when that news for that COVID-19 broke. But then after that, we had a bull market 
And then since the outbreak of the Ukraine war, the market has come down. But now I believe that we're nearing the bottom and probably will come up again. Finally, I want to talk about what I call the wonderful world of a deflation, the next slide. Uh, and I define inflation as an increase in prices, a reduction in purchasing power, and it's caused by an increase in money supply. Deflation on the other side is a decrease in prices, increases purchasing power, and is caused by technological innovation. And the next slide gives you some example, one example of how deflation works. In 2022, this year, I was able to look for a encyclopedia world book and it cost $1,000, but I can get all that information free on Google. That's deflation. Next slide, in 2050, a 30 minute call from Boston to New York cost me $41. Now on Zoom, which we're using now, international call is free. Next slide, cheaper services. iTunes between 2003 and 2009, 2009, it was about almost a dollar per song. Now on Spotify, you can get 80 million songs for about $10 a month. That's technology. Then if you look at the next slide, I don't know whether you remember the old Motorola Dynatech brick, we call it the brick in 1983. It cost $4,000. Now it's about $11,000 and lasted about 30 minutes. The iPhone costs about $1,000 and lasts six hours. And as you know, the iPhone does a heck of a lot more than the Motorola Dynatech. And then finally, uh, consumer incomes have beaten the high prices, which is the next slide. If we look at US price changes for main household expenditures between 1930 and 2017, uh, you can see all those things like flour, poultry, beef, eggs, et cetera. Uh, the increase in that period was about 754%. Uh, but the average incomes, during that same period, next slide, increased by 3,996%. So again, you can see what's happening. It not only is technology making things be it better and cheaper, but incomes continue to keep up with any inflation numbers that uh, are, is posted by the US government. If you want to hear more about this, uh, the next slide shows you the cover of my book, uh, The Inflation Myth and the Wonderful World of Deflation. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Um, let's see if I can try and get to a couple of questions for you. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and see this question from Chris Bolter. Bolster, he's asking, let's see, Chinese stocks, including dominant tech names have been beaten down on concerns about accounting, transparency, delisting, political intervention and demographics. Does the current situation qualify as a blood on the streets buying opportunity or are you cautious on the market? Um, I would say I'm somewhat cautious although I'm continuing to look for opportunities in China, uh, the market has come down pretty dramatically. Uh, yes, there's some accounting problems, but China is uh, dealing with this now. As you know, they've reached an agreement uh, with the US government regarding uh, uh, the accounting and the ability of the US to have more transparency with these uh, accounts, Chinese company accounts. So I'm... Uh, uh, I'm cautious, and I believe there could be opportunities in China, but I think uh, the key word is caution. I think you have to be cautious. And if you can find a company in China that has you know, a good uh, auditor, and by the way, the auditors are beginning to get their act together there, but you have a good auditor, high return on capital, uh, good earnings growth, you know, pricing power in this market, 
and no debt or low debt, then by all means, uh, it's a company that you want to go after in China. Because let's face it, China is a big country, a billion people, lots of things going on. Despite all the political problems, uh, it's a big market and it's worth looking at. By the way, when we invest in China, we usually go through Hong Kong because we find that you know the transparency is better in Hong Kong and it's just easier to trade. All right, Mark, we have another question in the chat. This one's from Jeffrey Hirsch. Um, he's asking, what do you think will trigger or signal the end of the 2022 bear market? Um, usually a bear market ends when everybody is uh, selling uh, in despair. In other words, despondently selling. Uh, we're not there yet. And as I mentioned, the crypto market is something to watch. If uh, the uh, Bitcoin price falls by, let's say, another 20%, then I think that would signal the beginning of the end of, of the, the bear market because there's so many people who are in the crypto area. And if they lose hope, then uh, probably, you know, we'll be at the end of the bear market. But but must remember, we still have more to go. I know there's more, uh, there could be more a downturn in this market. If you look at expenditures in America, I recently came from a trip throughout America, people are still spending a lot. <laughs> and that means, that means that people are flush. And also uh, people, don't need to look for jobs. There are jobs all over the place. So there's a shortage of labor, which indicates that people are still in good shape uh, with money. It's when uh, there's higher, much higher uh, unemployment and when people have really given up, then that would be the end of the bear market. I don't think we're there yet. Thank you so much, Mark. That does conclude our time for this session. So another huge thank you to all of you for joining us for this presentation and for your patience with us this morning. Be sure to stay tuned as we do still have a lot more in store for you today. I hope everyone has a great day and I hope you will stay safe. Thank you.